Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much. This is the Delta Mowbray webinar on wastewater treatments. Um, it is now four o'clock here in the UK. Uh, and I know some people will still be joining, but I think we'll make a start now. So good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending upon where you are in the globe. And welcome to this webinar on wastewater treatment. My name is Cathy Kluwer. And with me today, I have Andrew Cara, our development manager in the Americas, Robin Hudson, our product manager for the range of products we're highlighting here today, and Alistair Holtby, who is our technical guru, ensuring all is well with the webinar. So for the next hour or so, we'll be taking a brief overview on the wastewater industry to see why it is or it isn't worth investing in. We'll take a look at a case study where we've worked with a company before. This is actually a pre-recorded podcast and a copy of which will be sent to you after this webinar. Then we'll focus on some of the products actually used in this industry. Again, if you have any questions, may I ask you to put the questions in the chat box? Uh, that's the little speech bubble just above uh, the slides. And we'll get back to these probably at the end of the webinar. Um, as we are using Teams, could I ask you please to also keep yourselves on mute and your videos off? This will help to keep this webinar a little bit more fluid. So let's get started. OK, the world is definitely growing and we are going to reach um, a population of nine billion fairly quickly, um, all of whom are going to have a great demand on water. In addition, we've got climate change issues which are affecting the quantities and quality of water. Um, when we think about water and water problems, we tend to think of it as a third world problem. But the reality is it's become very much a first world problem and we therefore have to take action now to manage and control our water systems. Inside uh, the US, for example, um, there's been nearly 7000 deaths related to bad quality of water. So this is something that we really need to um, get a handle on and get a grip on. You know, even in today's modern world where we take water for granted, um, perhaps we need to understand what we need to do to control it. Thank you. So how much water can we utilise? Well, on this planet, um, we only have 3% of the world's water is fit for human consumption. And of that, 2% is actually in glaciers. Um, so we'd kind of like to keep them there as, if possible. The United Nations has given water treatment prominence as one of its development goals. So it's focusing on new technologies and pro um, projects, and all of these are being developed to protect what is becoming a vital resource. Water treatment uh, includes things such as desalination, rainwater harvesting, as well as wastewater treatment, all of which will reduce water scarcity. An actual fact, just about an hour or so before coming on today, uh, Water UK has just launched a public consultation on a new vision for 2050. And this is all about how we're going to handle water management going forward. So it is really is a hot topic. Thank you. So without doubt, there is a need for this industry and this industry is most definitely growing. Uh, there's a great focus on uh, the rebuild of existing infrastructure, the technology used for measuring and management and construction. And these, this industry is uh, projected to rise to about $456 billion in 2026. These figures were done in 2018 and actually show a growth rate of 42%. So that is a pretty high growth rate for any in industry. So I would say that's actually worth taking a bit of a look at. Thank you. So what happens when managing wastewater fails? Well, uh, there's an example here of a water company based in the UK um, who are actually taken to court for poor water management. Um, Water regulation is taken very, very seriously, and those companies that don't comply, the penalties are very heavy. So for this one infringement, which was fairly serious, uh, the infringement was basically that people were um, not 
uh, responding to alarms as they should. But more importantly, this waste treatment plant did not have the right equipment in place um, to regulate water and to highlight any problems. So they were fined 2.4 million UK pounds or the equivalent is $3.3 million for this one offence. So when it fails, um, there are there are penalties, not just financial ones, but great damage to corporate reputation, for example, um, as well. So let's turn this around a little bit and talk about what happens when it doesn't fail. And there is a company in Sweden who've taken a much more creative look at wastewater. And in fact, they've actually made beer out of wastewater as a way of proving that wastewater is clean, if not cleaner than the water that comes out of your tap. Um, and I think this is really a good way of looking at a circular economy. Um, they've actually made beer out of something um, which ordinarily we would be a little bit reluctant to. We're now going to take uh, a little bit more of a focus onto the USA and what is happening in the wastewater treatment there. So I'm actually going to hand over to Andre now um, just to lead you through this section. All right. Guys. All right. Well, thank you thank very you. much. So. Um, first of all, uh, hi everyone, and just as a quick introduction for those who do not know me, my name is Andre Parra, I'm the business development manager responsible uh, for the Americas here at Delta Mowbray. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank everybody to, to joining, uh, for joining us uh, at this uh, webinar. And what I would like to do is to uh, highlight and comment about some interesting statistics of the water and wastewater industry here in the US. So to start, what I would like to highlight to everybody is that we, we have nearly, as you can see there in the presentation, nearly 15,000 wastewater treatment plants here in the US from over uh, 650 uh, different organizations. Uh, as you know, most of them uh, part of the public sector uh, at the municipal level. But what, what is very curious and interesting about these numbers is that uh, according to some researches that we've done, according to the American Society of uh, Civil Engineers, for instance, most of our wastewater treatment plants are functioning at over 80, 81 percent of our of their design capacity. And at least 15% uh, of these 15,000 uh, plants, they have reached or exceeded its capacity already. Okay. Uh, when we add to this another uh, staggering finding uh, that approximately 20% of the Americans rely on uh, on site wastewater systems such as uh, septic tanks. And um, as you also probably aware, we, we have a thriving housing market in several regions of uh, the country. Uh, so it is uh, getting obvious that we we have lots of pressure from from the demand side, right? Uh, for the wastewater treatment and uh, the water market in general. So uh, it is obvious the, the the revenue for for these organizations that we have talked about they are they're set to grow, but it is also uh, obvious that uh, heavy investments in you know, wastewater treatment plants will will be required. All right. So uh, this is one of the reasons, in fact, that uh, despite of all the problems and and the downfalls of uh, 2020. Uh, uh, as many people are saying, a, a year to be forgotten, but uh, because of the pandemic. So the the water and wastewater industry in itself, the, this market grew about uh, 8.1% 8 1, 8 .1 in, in 2020 in comparison to 2019. So this graph here, uh, what, what is uh, actually depicting, we've depicted this graph actually from a ITR uh, economics report. Uh, 
showing that we uh, we have ended 2020 uh, with over 44 billion in, in investments for US public water and sewer uh, facilities construction. This is in a 12 month uh, moving total. Uh, and obviously this report is showing, uh, as you can see there, that we are posing to a little bit of a decline uh, in 2021. But in reality, the reason for this decline is, is actually because most of uh, the investment for uh, these type of facilities, they come from the public sector. And, and because of the pandemic, lots of the public funding is actually being diverted to, to fight the pandemic. So what we can expect, especially for 20. 22 onwards is like a, 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 a V-shaped comeback starting already in 2022, because as, as you know, the, the pressure uh, on the demand side is, is, is only get worse because, especially because of this uh, whole, uh, this halt in investments during 2021. Next slide, please. And on top of that, uh, it's also not about new construction, right? So the, the existing infrastructure also uh, requires lots of maintenance. And during our research for this webinar, we, we found some interesting facts such as these. Uh, I, I didn't know about this, but uh, a, a water main actually bursts every two minutes in the US which is uh, kind of astonishing to me, but uh, just to uh, paint a picture of uh, um, how old also our infrastructure uh, is getting and, and uh, proving the fact that it requires maintenance. Uh, and also that there is an enormous uh, gap between spending and public funding. Uh, right now about 81 billion, so there is uh, huge discussions actually about enabling private sector investment in large scale wastewater treatment, focusing uh, a lot on cost sharing and, and risk minimization. So next please. So to, to exemplify what we, are, we I was just talking about, what I would like to mention is this uh, specific case in, in Conroy, Texas. Uh, it's a, a still a, a small town located about 40 miles north of Houston, uh, where the city is investing like $60 million in a new central waste treatment plant. Uh, like I said, uh, it's a relatively small town uh, population currently about uh, 85,000, but just to paint the picture and how uh, the housing market here in the US for this specific city, they have seen a growth of over, uh, they, they mo more than double actually their population in the last decade. So they, they jumped from uh, uh, just underneath 40,000 to in, in 2010 to 85,000 plus uh, now currently in 2019, 2020. So they have this huge investment of uh, in a new uh, uh, wastewater treatment plant a project uh, that is around $60 million, which is uh, to be completed now in the spring of uh, uh, 2022. And, and this is uh, essentially to assist, uh, obviously, the, the pressure and demand that this, this growth in population is, is putting a lot of pressure in the system and, and to enable a, a continuous growth uh, of the city. 
Right, so with that said, what I would like to, to do is to hand the presentation back to Kathy. Uh, so she will talk about some, some other interesting uh, wastewater treatment facts of uh, the famous Las Vegas. <laughs> So why Las Vegas? Why are we going to focus on Las Vegas? Um, well, it's one of the world's most famous towns for a start. It's based in a desert and it has a fluctuating, fluctuating population of over 40 million visitors a year. It has very little rainfall, low humidity, and it's one of the hardest places in the world to retain water. But they do. They've figured it out. They know what to do. <clears throat> and they've had to because they have a really strange and bizarre law which is still in place today, and that states that they can only take 2% of water from Lake Mead. And this was fine when the population was only about 2,000. But now the actual population is over 2.5 million with 40 million visitors per year. So that's an awful lot of people to cater for with very little water. Um, so therefore they have to recycle and they have to really understand water management very, very well. Next slide, please. And they've even turned water into a tourist attraction um, outside the Bellagio Hotel. Uh, it's a very famous hotel. It's a very famous tourist attraction. Water cannons jettison water into the air you know, several times a day in time to music and with lights. Um, and in this playground, they use water for domestic, for business, for hotels and for entertainment. So what may look like a very flippant thing to do with water is actually a very clever and controlled business because they have one of the best water reclamation programs in the world and they actually save money on their water reclamation. Um, so far from it being flippant, it is actually a compelling business uh, with, finance, with good finance and good sustainability. In a waste treatment plant, the universe is busy. Uh, we expect them to produce clean water and that's that's just expected. Um, however, they also get involved in various other factors which are very important for our, our well-being. Um, so there's a reduction of waste, there's production of fertilizer which gets sent to, to local farms, obviously disease prevention, so none of us are poorly. Um, quite a few of them can actually produce their own energy. So they may not be totally self-sufficient, but they're certainly on the road to getting there. And then of course, there is the clean water for recreation, um, which we all enjoy. <clears throat> um, and they have to manage this every day and they need good equipment to make it happen. So just a few weeks ago, I asked Robin, um, one of our product managers, uh, to tell me about a case study uh, that he worked on, a company that he worked on um, here in the UK. So the next bit of this webinar is actually a podcast. It's a recording of our conversation um, about a wastewater treatment plants in the UK. Hello and welcome to the Delta Mowbray podcast. Today we'll be discussing the work we completed at a large wastewater treatment plant based in the UK and the impact it had on the site. My name is Cathy Kluwer and I'm the marketing manager for Delta Mowbray. With me today, I'm delighted to have one of our product managers, Robin Hudson, who's responsible for the product range used at this site. So Robin, who are we going to be talking about today and would you like to introduce the company and what they needed from us? Hello Cathy, yes, yes sure. This is about a water company based in the UK that serves around 15 million people across London and surrounding areas through a network of just over 350 water treatment plants. Wow. And like many of these water treatment organisations, they don't just clean the water, they also use the more undesirable stuff or bioproducts to turn it into electrical power. Really? Um, yeah, this company generates 20% of its own energy directly from the waste. And, and further to this, the leftovers are supplied as fertilisers for the farming communities. And then, of course, the recycled water is put back into the water system to be delivered as suitable for human consumption. Right. So, like all water companies, they also have a responsibility for keeping the local waterways, such as rivers, clean. Well, I mean, that that's an awful lot of differing activity for one organisation. And I imagine that it all needs to be carefully managed. And I mean, all of it, not just the water supply. 
Yes, all wastewater treatment plants need to work with a number of regulators. So here in the UK, there is Ofwat, the Environment Agency, the Health Protection Agency, DEFRA, Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, etc. And it's the same all over the world. It's a highly regulated industry. It needs to follow strict rules. Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose you would expect that just because um, the more we're reading about water these days, the more it's becoming a valuable resource. And obviously it's essential for our own good health and well-being. So I suppose it does need to be heavily regulated at all times. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The, the focus on water treatment plants is getting stronger and stronger. And these organisations, they have to be highly regulated to meet the safety standards for the populations they serve. The regulation within the USA, for example, the Safe Water Drinking Act, SWDA, is continuously being updated since its introduction in 1974. Uh, the water treatment in US is one of the top priorities for the Environment Protection Agency. But I'm sure that has to be a high priority across the globe to ensure that water doesn't become a finite resource, but one that we can make more sustainable and healthy for us all. So, so this kind of brings me back to the company that you worked with in the UK. So as there are so many differing factors within a water treatment plant, which bit did Delta Mowbray actually work with here? Well, we were asked to assist with some of the measurement and reporting in the final settlement tanks. And as we said before, it's really important to know what is happening within the treatment plant. And more importantly, to know immediately if something's not working as it should. And the crucial factor for this company was to categorically know and be confident that sludge does not overflow from the final settlement tank into the local waterway. Um, they did have a solution, but it wasn't effective for them as there is more than one settlement tank. And under their previous workflow, they would have known that there was a problem, but would not have known from which tank. So their real challenge was sludge blanket layer detection. Challenge? The challenge was a sludge blanket detection. All right. OK, for those of us who are not working in the wastewater treatment industry, what is a sludge blanket? And I'm not sure I want to hear the full answer, but I'm sure you'll handle it well. Yeah. Um, during the wastewater treatment, water is allowed to settle in various tanks so that gravity allows the heavier aspects of the water to drop to the bottom of the tank, whilst the lighter elements filter to the top. And the sludge blanket is really the top layer of the settled solids. Right. So for the best possible outcome, the sludge blanket should be maintained at around 0.6 or metres or two feet. And that's deep enough to ensure that the real nasties are held at the bottom whilst um, ensuring that the lighter aspects, like the cleaner water, the supernatant rises to the top. And it's imperative that a good sludge blanket system is maintained, so knowing the depth is imperative. Mm -hmm. um, the wastewater can't be allowed to mix with the clean water until it meets all of the recognised criteria set by those agencies we mentioned earlier. Right, okay. So, so the sludge blanket is so large, what did the company need to look out for? They needed to make sure that the sludge blanket layer would not rise to a level where it would overflow the surrounding weir and then be discharged into the waterways. And our recommendation to meet that challenge was to use a gap sensor and a control unit that was fitted onto a rotating bridge in each of the final sediment tanks. Mm -hmm. So we put a sensor within the supernatant and this continues to feed back to the control unit positioned above on the rotating arm. OK, so, so how does that instrument actually measure the sludge blanket layer? Well, it doesn't actually measure it. It detects the difference between the clean water, the supernatant and the sludge. So the ultrasonic signal from the sensors passes easily through the clean water, but it gets interrupted or attenuated by the sludge. And the control unit detects this change and switches a relay to indicate an alarm condition. The actual tanks are identified and they can then investigate the problem. So overall, a lot of time is saved and any chance of damaging the environment and receiving penalties is greatly reduced. Right. Um, we chose this solution because the gap sensors have proved to be trouble free controls for practical applications where some of the alternative technologies um, need regular attention. And this system, therefore, it provides an ideal solution to detect the increasing sludge levels and trigger alarms and to ensure that preventative action can be taken to safeguard the environment. All right. So, so we've used the ultrasonic gap sensors, um, but which products did we specifically use here? Because I know I know we have a range. 
Yeah, yeah. We use the Delta Mowbray Undissolved Solid Sensor, the, the 433SD, which can measure up to 30% of solids for wastewater applications and higher for other industries. Mm -hmm. And we use this with the Delta Mowbray Control Unit, the MCU 200 series, which is a, overall, it's a simple cost-effective um, solution. The, the electronics controller has LED indicators for alarm status, um, showing normal alarm fault conditions, it has cable health checks. So mm -hmm. overall, it's a simple but effective way to assist a, a wastewater company run effectively. Mm -hmm. um, this simple and dependable solution has worked well for this company, so we're really pleased to be honest. Okay, so would you, would you say it was fair, would you say it was a fair thing to say um, that not everything inside a wastewater treatment um, has to be complex, that sometimes those simple products with less things to go wrong are actually equally, if not more effective for the company. Yeah, that, that's that's right. And I, I think this solution was perfect for this application. It, it's simple, but um, it's not exactly what they need. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, Robin, for that. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot more areas in the plant that we could work with, uh, with this case, with this customer and for other customers going forward. Uh, but for now, thanks for the time and for chatting about this particular case study. Cheers for now. Bye. OK, we're, we're back again live, um, but I'm pleased to say that we've got Robin with us and he's going to talk about a few of the products in that case study and uh, products that have been used in this industry. This is in no way um, all of our range, but we thought we'd just um, highlight a few as we've got limited time today. And as always, we can offer equipment to measure temperature, pressures, gauges, and all the accessories that are actually going to be used. Uh, so Robin, if I could hand over to you. That would yep, be great. Thank you, Kathy. Yep, so as you said, I'm Robin Hudson, product manager for a range of our products. And I'm first gonna be talking about our gap sensors. So we're going to talk about the range of products, the MCU 200, the MSM 400, and uh, just summarise those products. So we're going to look at the MCU 200 and the sensors. So these are pictured on the left here. Um, the controller has a switched output, so this is giving, uh, it's acting as a switch. And then on the right here, you can see the MSM 400 controller and sensors. And this has a continuous output, a continuous four to 20 milliamp output. And so this is giving a measurement. And both of these are used on sludges and slurries. Looking a bit more closely at the MCU 200 controller and sensors. So the controller itself, we, we saw it in the podcast. It has an LED status um, showing normal alarm fault, um, has relay outputs to reflect that and it could be mains or 24 volt DC supply. The sensors that you can see in the center here, at the top we have an interface sensor, and in the middle, um, a gap sensor, which again you saw in the podcast, and at the bottom here, sensors to be used across a pipe section. And the image on the right here is just showing the product data sheet. So looking a bit more closely at the 433 sensors, uh, their main application is sludge blanket detection in clarifiers and municipal wastewater primary and secondary settlement tanks. So these sensors, they have a, a they use piezos in a welded assembly and they're for suspension within a tank. And you can see on the image to the right, these are they're intended to be suspended down from the top of the tank and um, set a set position within the tank. Thank you, Alistair. And this is the data sheet for those sensors. So you can see there's a range of different gap sensor sizes for these sensors. So starting at four inches and going up to 18 inches. Um, we have a table within the data sheet for the different ranges, the different measuring ranges for the different sizes. That will be explained a bit better, a bit clearer on the next slide. So this table is showing um, different recommendations of different gap sensor sizes for different types of sludge. So looking at primary sludge, for example, um, what I've highlighted here is what we recommend 
for, for primary slug, we'd recommend a six inch sensor. And that can cover the measuring range of from two to 19%. And then looking to the right, for secondary sludge, we'd recommend an 18 inch sensor, which could measure from 0.5 to 3.3% sludge density. And this is uh, the note at the bottom of this table within the data sheet helps um, mm. to, to show that. But the, the, the bottom line here is the, the rule of thumb is that for a low percent solids, we need a wide gap. For a high percent solids, we use a small gap. And looking at the other two sensor types, we also have a 40T, 402SD sensor, which is mainly used for interface detection, and a 442SD pipe mountable sensor. Um, the second table here is just showing the controller, the two different types of controller we have, the AC main supply and the 24 volt DC supply versions. Next slide, please, Alistair. Thanks. Uh, this, this slide is showing the principle of operation um, for the controller. Uh, the green box is representing the, the liquid here, if you like, the, the water or the sludge and the two pizzos either side, the transmit and the receive. So we're sending a signal to the transmit crystal, the pizzo, which is being picked up by the opposite one. And that's a continuous um, ultrasonic signal. And so the MCU 200 controller will detect a change in that, in that signal. So for a clear water, there'll be a low attenuation. It will receive a strong signal, and that's the normal state. Then for a thick sludge, there'll be a high attenuation and it will just receive a weak signal and that's the alarm state. So that's how it's, it's measuring or, de or detecting the difference between clear water and sludge. Looking inside the MCU 200, we have a number of different um, user controls. So these need to be set up and configured by the end user. And so this can be used to, to set the operating frequency or set the gain control. And so we're setting the point at which it's measuring the dif difference between clear water and sludge. So that's something that needs to be configured for any given application. And so, Looking again at that case study that we're talking about in the podcast. Um, so wastewater treatment plants, they have primary and secondary sediment tanks. And these large tanks, they allow the sediment to sink to the bottom. The clean water overflows and runs out to rivers. When the sediment reaches the top, it's pumped out and collected. And so the MCU and the gap sensor could detect when the sludge has reached that, that top level within the tank. And, and indeed, when it's gone past the maximum level that it should be at. And to the right here, you can see that um, that case study that, we, again, we were talking about for the wastewater treatment plant in the UK. That, that particular plant had about 40 sediment tanks where they installed this, this particular solution. So looking now at the MSM 400. So you might remember that first slide, we had the MCU 200 and the MSM 400. So this is now giving a, a continuous output. So it's a measurement. So again, it's used with a, a selection of sensors. It has a display now with a menu, um, gives a continuous measurement, operates at two different frequencies. It has three different outputs. It has the 4 to 20 milliamp continuous output, but it also has a relay output and heart comms, um, but it also has hazardous area approval. And again, similar to the MCU 200, it, it must be calibrated on site with a particular fluid that it's going to be used with. And looking at the gap sensors for use with the MSM 400, again, we have the, the style of gap sensor for tank installation. And again, we have the different gap sizes and the same principle, the same rule of thumb applies. 
for a low percent solids, you'd use a wise, wide gap. For high percent solids, a high density, you'd use a narrow gap. We also have another solution, a pipe section. So you can see in the Im image on the right how this is installed at the bottom of a settlement tank. And so this offers another installation method. It's exactly the same principle. It's using sensors now instead of on a welded peak on welded metal assembly. It's um, mounted across on opposite sides of a pipe section. And again, with a number of different process connections and, and pipe diameters. We also have um, another solution, a pipe kit, which um, uh, it's just the sensors themselves so that these can be fitted to the customer's pipe and welded on opposite sides of the pipe. Um, similar to the pipe section, but just a, another alternative method of installation. So ordering information for the controller, we just have the one model. Um, it has, as it says here, ATEX and IECEX um, hazardous area approvals. Um, as I mentioned before, display, push button controls, menu, 4 to 20 milliamp relays, heart digital communications um, must be calibrated at installation on site. Thank you. And we have a number of case studies for the MSM 400. Um, to the left here and centre, we have two case studies from the wastewater industry. On the right, we have another case study, this time from the power industry for flue gas desulfurisation, I think measuring a limestone slurry. These are all available from our website. So just to summarise on those solutions, on the left again, the MCU 200 and the sensors, it's the lower cost solution, relay switched output for safe area use only. And then to the right, the MSM 400 controller and sensors. So now we have the continuous measurement with the 4 to 20 milliamp output, heart communications, hazardous area approvals, and again, in tight tank or pipe section and pipe kit installations. OK, thank you, Alistair. Fantastic, Robin, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that covers But are you ready to go? into a little bit more detail uh, recently launched on ultrasonics. Yes, indeed, Cathy, yes. Um, so as mentioned before, I'm a product manager for various uh, ranges of products, and this includes the ultrasonic um, level products. And also just to mention that I was uh, previously the, the product manager as well for the Mowbray and Rosemount branded um, versions of, um, of the um, products we had back then, so I'm quite familiar with those as well. So I'm, I'm able now, thankfully, to talk about about um, both both the old products and the new, and the advantages of the new range of uh, ultrasonic products. But firstly, why ultrasonics? Um, no moving parts, resistance to corrosion, maintenance free, virtually unaffected by density, dielectric, viscosity, process pressure, temperature. Uh, minimum installation requirements. They tend to be installed at the top of a tank, so it's, it's fairly simple. Um, Self-learning functionality, so they can be set to ignore any any false echo within the tank, anything that would um, otherwise confuse them. Um, they can be combined with controller. Um, they're simple to configure, especially when used with a controller. Uh, that, that controller has large LCD display logging capability. So all in all, a very cost effective, simple solution. And ultrasonic versus radar. Well, there's already a, a very large, a huge, in fact, installed base of ultrasonic level transmitters. And operators are familiar with the technology. They trust it and they're, they're reluctant to change. So so many plants, many operators, they, they're not really looking to change from ultrasonic uh, to radar. In fact, they want to stay with the technology that they know. Um, a particular difficulty with guided wave radar, it, um, 
It uses a rod to guide the microwaves, and this must be supplied to a set length for a particular tank. And therefore, guided wave radars, they can't be stocked for use on different tanks with differing depths. So they can't be swapped around easily. You can't, you can't keep them on a, on a shelf at, for, for use on different um, tanks. Um, also, radar is a higher cost solution. And yes, it gives a higher accuracy, but that's, that's not needed in the water industry, in the wastewater industry. That's only really justified for higher value fluids. So how does it work? Um, the piezoelectric crystal um, in the sensor, in the bottom of the face of the transducer, it transmits an ultrasonic pulse several, several times every second. And that pulse bounces off the liquid surface and it's returned as an echo. And that time delay before the echo returns is measured. And what we call the time of flight is used to calculate the distance down from the transducer to the top of the liquid level. Then by configuring the transmitter with the distance from its face down to the bottom of the tank, it can subtract the measured distance from the total distance and it can work out, calculate the level, the level of the liquid within the tank. And furthermore, if we actually configure it with the dimensions of the tank, it can also um, report back the, the volume or the contents within the tank. And so that, that measurement is output as a 4 to 20 milliamp or heart signal. So Delta Mobra's new range of ultrasonic level products. Um, to the left here, you see the tank mount models. What you're actually looking at, the, the two smaller images to the left there, um, the top one, the yellow one is the Mowbray branded, um, the yellow version, and the below that is the rose mount in, in blue. And so these are now replaced by um, the Delta Mowbray um, model, which you see here to the right. Similarly, for the, the models for the sumps, wet wells or flow, um, we have again the, the Mowbray and the Rose Mountain models. And again, we now have the new Delta Mowbray transmitter. I'll be looking at these in a bit more detail on the next few, few slides. And again, with the controller, we have the Mowbray and the Rose Mount controller. We now have the Delta Mowbray controller replacing those model options. And each of these new products offers more functionality and more options than before. So looking a bit more closely now at the DMSP 400 and 500 series. So these are used for tank installation. We now have the DMSP 422, which replaces the uh, previous Mowbray MSP 422 and the Rosemount version, which was the 3101. So this model has uh, only 4 to 20 milliamps, so it's the base model, if you like. Um, we also now have the DMSP 400, so this replaces the Mowbray MSP 400 and the Rosemount 3102. This now has 4 to 20 milliamps um, heart relay outputs. And we now have the, the DMSP 500, which replaces the MSP 900 GH and the Rosemount 3105. So this is the ATEX version, with, again with 4 to 20 milliamp and heart outputs. But what you'll see is we now have a number of different measuring range options. So starting at four metres, then six metres, eight, up to 25 metres. So this allows us to have um, scaled pricing according to the uh, measuring range. But also what you'll notice in the bottom row of that uh, table is we have different installation options for, for the measuring ranges. So each measuring range will have a, a, a different um, method of installation. Um, but what you can also note, if you, if you only need, for example, a six metre um, solution, six metre measuring range, but you need a three inch flanged connection, then you could go up and offer the six metre range transmitter. So these flanges, they're available in both DN or ANSI. OK, OK, thank you, Alistair. Um, yes, this table showing the uh, differences, um, the specifications for each range of products. So to the left here, we have the Delta Mowbray um, products, to the right, the um, Mowbray. 
and the same specification for the Rosemount models. But I'll go in, on the next slide, I will pick out the um, more salient differences, if you like. So um, the DMSP 400, 500, as I mentioned, we now, now have the multiple ranges for scaled pricing. The maximum range has now increased to 25 metres, where previously it was just 11 metres. We also now have a narrower, more focused beam angle, the ultrasonic beam coming down from the transmitter to avoid false echoes of uh, anything to either side of the, the beam within a tank. We have more different process connection op options with the flanged models. We also now have plastic or painted aluminium housings. With the Mowbray models, we only have the plastic options. And we just have more features, more functionality. And we are in the process of applying for um, approval suitable for the North American market. Excuse me. <laughs> Looking at the data sheets now for these um, models, you can see that um, a simple method of um, selecting the, the model code at the top here, the generic model code for the range, and then in another table, the table below, um, we can select the measuring range. So, for example, at the top here, 0.25 metres to 4 metres, and then select the process connection. So the first example here for the process connection, one to one, one and one and a half inch BSP is model code A. And the data sheet also includes um, the, the uh, drawings for each of the housing types. So um, you can see the different installation options for each um, model. So you can see in the top row here, we have the threaded connections and in the in the lower row, um, we have the flanged connections for the higher ranged model options from 10 meters up to 25 meters measuring range. We have those flanged options there. OK, thank you, Alistair. Um, now looking at the DMSP 900 series, so whereas the series before we had a um, an LCD display and push buttons for configuration um, below the lid. Now this model is fully self-contained. Um, it has heart comms, so ideally it would be used with a controller and then it would be configured from that controller. So now we have the DMSP 900, which replaces the Mowbray MSP 900, SH and FH. FH being the flow model and also replaces the Rosemount 3107 and 3108 and 3108 again was the model for flow. This is open channel flow, which I'll talk about later. And these models have both 4 to 20 milliamp and heart outputs, so they're suitable for level contents and open channel flow. And we have three different options here. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, could you go back a moment, Alistair? Thank you. Yeah, three different model options. Um, again, um, the different ranges, so up to six metres, up to 10 metres, up to 15 metres and different connections. Now, for all those options, we have a one inch BSP connection at the top of the sensor. Now, in this image to the to the left here, um, for the lower ranged model to six metres, there will also be an additional threaded connection at the bottom here which would be either two inch BSP or two inch MPT. Um, for the higher ranged models, 10 meters and 15 meters, we only have the one inch BSP at the top. Okay, next slide please, Anastasia. Thank you. And again, we have the uh, specification and I'll pick out again the, the main points um, to compare in the next slide. Thank you. So, uh, max, maximum range has increased again, so now with this model variant we can measure up to 15 metres. Again, we have a narrower beam angle to avoid false echoes. Um, as I mentioned, with the lower range unit, we have two process connections, one at the top, one at the bottom. So we can now have that two inch MPT connection. 
Um, the cable lengths, uh, we can now have a choice of cable lengths, five meters, 10 meters, 20, 30. Um, generally, we, we have improved functionality. And again, um, we have the application in process for the North American market approvals. So the data sheet for these model options um, is uh, we, we um, have uh, choices, the MSP 900 SH, 901, 902, 903, and the data sheet explains, it shows the, the different um, measuring range and the different process connections for each. And then we also have, we can select the approval and we can select the cable length. And the data sheet also gives the dimensional drawings and that also shows the different process connections for, for each. Now looking at the controller, we have three different model options. So um, we have the DMCU 901, which replaces the Mowbray MCU 901 and the Rosemount 3491. So single heart transmitter input outputs 4 to 20 milliamps and four relays. Then we have the DMCU 902, so that replaces the Mowbray MCU 902 and the Rosemount 3492. And so this has dual heart transmitter inputs, and so for two heart transmitters and outputs 4 to 20 milliamps and four relays. And then we also have the DMCU 90F, that replaces the Mowbray MSP 90F and the Rosemount 3493. So again, this just has a single heart transmitter input um, and 420 and relay outputs. But this model is, is really, it's intended for open channel flow. It has logging, it has download capability um, with SD card and USB interface. And all these models, they supply an intrinsically, or they give an intrinsically safe power supply for the transmitters, which would be in the hazardous area. Again, we can uh, compare the specifications for each, um, which I'll do again in more detail on the next slide. So the main advantage of the new controllers, the new range of controllers, we have a larger display with more information. Uh, we, we have a, a protective front cover, um, which uh, a transparent front cover. Uh, we have a much larger logging capability of the of the DMCU 90F over the previous versions. Um, we have SD card USB connection for data downloading for logging data for open channel flow. And we have as before we have both wall mount and panel mount options. So the DMCU controller when used with the DMSP 900 transmitter, it now provides a, an ideal solution because we can use that controller to configure the transmitter. So we have a menu driven display, um, transmitter configuration, four relays which can be used for pump control, data logging for flow applications. And again, that, that controller is, is giving an intrinsically safe power supply for the transmitter. Um, now, for full functionality, we would always recommend that the two be used together. The Dalton Mowbray controllers used with Dalton Mowbray transmitters. It, sometimes that's not always possible. Maybe a, a customer wants to replace one, but not the other. Um, and that is possible. There is, um, because they're both heart devices, there is some common communications between the two. But in for occasions, if you come across this, this, re this requirement, then please do contact us for for help in, in advising the right solution. And again, the table in the data sheets, um, very simple case of, of selecting um, model, model codes, of selecting the housing and the approval. The typical applications, um, sumps and wet wells, pumping stations, um, tanks, whether they be open or closed, open air reservoirs, open channel flow, um, blocked filter detection. So that's having two transmitters either side of a filter so that uh, it's, it's given a differential measurement. 
um, when there's when there's a difference between the two, then you know that your filter's blocked. And these images to the right here, um, the furthest to the right, of course, is the tank installation, which you've seen and talked about earlier. Um, the other image just to the left here, this is an example of open channel flow, um, which you might not all be familiar with, but it's using a weir or a flume to, to give an obstruction to the water flow. Now, if you measure the um, water level before that restriction, by using the right um, formula, the transmitter can calculate the flow rate through the flume or weir. And this is what is meant by open channel flow. OK, thank you, Alistair. OK. Thank you. So back to you, Cathy. And thanks for your time. <laughs> thank you, Robin. Uh, that brings us close to the end of this webinar. But, um, do we have any questions? Yes, indeed. Uh, we do have uh, some questions here that we uh, we would like to answer. So the first question, uh, Robin, actually from uh, Hishan, is can we install level transmitters to measure uh, ultrasonic level transmitters to measure crude oil level? What is the minimum distance limitation of the tank wall and the nozzle for ultrasonic level transmitter installation? So that's his first question. Yeah, yeah, there's no reason why they can't be used for oil, um, hydrocarbons. Of course, you know, we need to offer the hazardous area approved models. Um, there's recommendations for nozzles. Um, and I'd have to uh, <laughs> perhaps sort of take that question aside and go into a bit more detail um, rather than sort of uh, going through it now. But yes, there are certain recommendations. They, they can be used with nozzles. And um, of course, it's, it's recommended that they're not, they're not too close to the side of a tank. Um, but, but I could Very just good. discuss that in, in, in more detail, if, if you like, later. Right. Directly. So yeah, just yeah. just so you know, Shen, we'll, we'll we'll get back with you uh, with further information. Actually, we'll we'll reply this to everybody. Uh, just so you know. Okay. Uh, we have another two questions here, uh, Robin uh, from uh, Gary, uh, and uh, one of them is uh, related to the uh, upper NPT uh, connections uh, if they're going to be available uh, anytime soon uh for for the electrical connections part and also uh, what are the built-in flow equations for open flow uh, measurement okay yes yeah. for the upper for the upper connection and i think you're thinking of the dmsp 900 range that has that um upper threaded connection at the moment it is just one inch bsp we are aware that there is a, obviously a need for the one inch mpt and that's something that we'd like to obviously like to um introduce uh, it won't be any time right, uh, right soon, uh, but it's something that we 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 do intend to address. Yes, and sorry, that second question. Oh yes, the flow this... calculations. Yeah, there's a number of different flow calculations for different types of weirs, and I think there's there's roughly uh, perhaps ten ten different equations, and they're all um, within the software of the transmitter. So it's the transmitter that's doing the calculation, and not the controller. Um, these are listed in the manual, which is available to download off the website, but I can certainly send you a, a summary if, if Andre, if you take a note of any contact details, I can send out um, a list of what those standard equations are. Right, okay. Yeah, we. I think we have only time for uh, probably one, one other question uh, here. So I'll, I'll get back to all the other questions afterwards. We, we will address those and, and try to reply to everybody. But uh, this last question is, can the sensors be used for turbulent uh, fluid surface? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's certain things that all ultrasonic tr uh, transmitters you need to be a bit cautious of, such as turbulence, um, foam, uh, vapors, for example. It, it, we would never say, um, that it couldn't be used. It's just you need to do give. Um, you just need to be a bit cautious and 
um, try and assess, you know, whether the turbulence seems excessive uh, or look for a point of installation where the, there's minimum amount of turbulence. So uh, again, they, they can be used, yes, but you need to sort of maybe sort of assess the situation a little. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, uh, for the questions. Uh, I think uh, in the interest of time, I think we, we're closing the uh, question, the Q&A session right now, but uh, we'll, we'll be happy to reply with any answers uh, after this, after the meeting is ended. Sure. Kathy. And, and just as a reminder to everybody, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar a recording of the podcast, uh, plus all links to case studies and products shown. And of course, we'll give uh, full answers to Q&A. Uh, so everybody's going to get um, all the answers that they were looking for. So this just leaves me to thank the team here uh, at Delta Mowbray for putting this together. So thanks very much, guys. And um, most of all, thank you very much for all of you guys for attending and joining us at this event. So until next time, take care and cheers for now. Cheers. Thank right. you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.